A short note before you listen to this podcast. The events that are related in the following episodes are recent, and the wounds to those affected by them are still very fresh. I would ask as you listen and discuss this to be mindful of those involved, especially before you know the full story as it unfolds over the course of these 12 episodes. Please remember that these are real people, some of them suffering from a nightmare so horrible that they still have difficulty accepting that it even happened. Not recording anymore. You me. my truck. You have beat me up. Then get out of my truck. I have I want beat me up. You took in my Rolex. Video. You took my Rolex. You took my Rolex. You beat me up. Everything hurts. Just get out of my truck. I'm, I'm not getting out until I get my Rolex. This very disturbing recording is of 25-year-old Adea Shabani, an aspiring actress who moved from Macedonia to Hollywood to pursue her dreams of becoming, as she put it, a different kind of star. But just three weeks before I'm recording this, Adea Shabani went missing, vanished without a trace from outside her apartment on Hollywood Boulevard, right alongside the legendary Walk of Fame. A young and beautiful woman with dreams of making it in Hollywood now missing. The 25-year-old seen in this photo with Kanye West had been in L.A. for less than two years. Friends are now desperate for answers after she disappeared on Friday. Something is going on with her. We don't know where she is. It's just so sad. We, we're just hoping she's alive. I don't know where Adea is, but I have a good idea who does. He's been on the run since Adea disappeared, armed with two guns and a metal club. Right now, I'm sitting outside the apartment where he's believed to be staying, and it's my turn to confront him. I'm alone. I'm not armed. I've never been in a fight in my life. And I'm regretting this. Chapter One, The Call. And all I remember is like buckling in, I'm like looking down at the pipe and I'm like, I don't know, I could just see, I literally can see the run unfolding. I'm like, okay, wow. I'm going to hit this wall, I'm going to travel this far, I'm like looking at it and everything got really still. The voice you hear is that of snowboarder Sean White. We're in the offices of his talent agency and I'm interviewing him about his Olympic win. On the table rests his Olympic gold medal. At this exact moment, just five miles away on Hollywood Boulevard, Adea Shabani is disappearing, possibly even worse. And here I am, freaking out over a tiny piece of metal. So this landed perfect, and I'm like, this is it. You, got, you can do this. And I just right. gave it a little more oomph than right. normal. Right. And then I'm riding away like, holy fuck. Yeah, yeah, I just, just yeah. I'm going to win the Olympics. Yeah, exactly. It's over. But this is my job. Rolling Stone assigns me to do things like ride motorcycles with Tom Cruise, or go to rocket factories with Elon Musk, or shop for Pampers with Snoop Dogg. And then I write about what it's like hanging out with him. But what I don't do is investigating crime and hard news and missing people. At least I didn't. Not until I received this call. So I wanted to ask you a question about this other case that I'm working. Yeah. So I don't know, you might have seen it in the in the news. I I don't know, but you know, it's another missing person's case. Her name's Adea Shabani. She's a girl from Macedonia. She's been here uh, like for about 18 months, hired by her family. She lives in Hollywood. Anyway, she was last seen on Friday. And and you know, I mean, which, which this Friday or the Friday, like the week before? No, this Friday. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's Jaden Brandt. I'm not sure how to best introduce Jaden because our relationship is a little odd. About a year earlier, a 20 year old student went missing in my neighborhood in Malibu, California. And as a community member, I volunteered to help find her. Jaden, 
a former police detective who's now a highly in-demand private investigator, was working with the family of that missing student in Malibu. And I guess as a new father, I felt the need to help the missing woman's family and also just make sure our community was safe. So I began reaching out to Jaden, probably initially as a pest. But eventually, he began calling me for advice. So this call was another one of those conversations. It just happened to be about a new case. Basically, at this point, I mean, we have no leads, no suspects. We do know that she was last seen on some video surveillance in Hollywood, kind of right near her apartment around 11 a.m., She had last communication with friends at uh, around 2, 2 2.30. We know her apartment door was left unlocked. The real odd thing is that there appears to be some usage on her computer that night, but no phone activity, no communication with anybody. As Jaden spoke, I looked through Adea's social media. It is, in a word, glamorous. There are professional modeling shots, exotic European beach vacations, and pictures on the red carpet at premieres and events. In short, it looks like a Hollywood dream. And many of the inspirational quotes underneath the images are also about dreams, such as this one from Michael Gambon. Dreamy kids become actors, don't they? I don't know. I mean, we're trying to get some press going on it. I don't know if it's, you know, something you're interested in. Maybe write a story for Rolling Stone or... You know, it's one of those compelling cases. I mean, she's young. She's this beautiful, aspiring actress. You know, I think it could be a good case. I mean, obviously, you know, we're open to find her. But I don't know. What are your thoughts? I told him I'd think about it and to keep me in the loop. We found these flyers at several businesses here at Hollywood and Wilcox, where police say she was last seen. Her name is Adea, Adea Shabani. Beautiful inside and out, say her close friends, who also say they're worried sick over the 25-year-old. She's been missing since the morning of February the 23rd. That's when she went to the Rise and Grind coffee shop and vanished. There's absolutely no evidence that she is a voluntary missing, that she's a runaway. Jaden Brandt is the private investigator hired by the Shabani family to try and find Adea. The 25-year-old's mother flew into town from the Republic of Macedonia a couple of days ago. Now, there's nothing yet to indicate foul play, but friends suspect that Adia Shabani is being held against her will. As time continued to pass, she's been gone for more than a week with no leads and no developments. It's been 11 days since anyone has seen or heard from Adea Shabani. Initial press coverage started to fade. No one has actually seen her in almost two weeks. The police had very strangely asked the family not to do any interviews. So they'd spoken to no one, and frustration was mounting. It's just another case. And the media has died down. Yeah. See, that's the other thing. Like, if the media comes back, it puts pressure on the police. Because right. they were much more active, engaging, doing shit when it was all over the nightly news. As Jaden went on describing the family's plight, I wondered to myself why I hadn't gotten involved yet. I felt like one of those people who sees a car crash and just rubbernecks and holds up the traffic. Maybe there was something I could do to help. Maybe, unlike the Malibu disappearance, if I really started reporting on this for an article or a piece or a podcast, I could make a difference for this family. Little did I know that this small conversation would soon turn into a serious commitment that would put me and my family at risk. In fact, I've recently been told that if I release this podcast, quote, bad things are going to happen to me in a sense of a threat on my life or my safety or that of my family. I've decided, obviously, to go ahead and release this I wish I could give you a good reason as to why I've made that decision. But I've discussed it with my family. And I suppose it's that if someone is threatening your life to stop you from doing something, it's a good sign that you're pretty close to the truth. Chapter 2. Zest for Life. (laughs) 
This is uh, Neil. Hi, I'm Neil. Hey, nice to meet you. And this is Alex, who works with me. Right. Yeah, yeah, thanks for taking you the time. Want to get you some coffee? I'll get, I can get you something. I'm at the Rise and Grind coffee shop on Hollywood Boulevard. It's the last place Adea Shabani was seen, and I'm meeting her mother, Nora, for the first time, and formally, I suppose, beginning this investigation. Just one day has passed since I told Jade and I'd get involved, and he's trying to get me caught up to speed as quickly as possible, which means speaking directly with Adea's family and friends. Thanks for coming. Yeah. So we'll be here or in the apartment? I think what we'll do is we'll just go up to the apartment, but definitely not here because it's too loud. Yes, it's too loud. Yeah. Together we walk back to Adea's apartment to speak. I'm nervous because I don't know what to say to someone who's in Nora's position, with so much fear and sadness and uncertainty about her child. Especially since just a few days earlier, it was Adea's 26th birthday. And her loved ones didn't have their friend, their classmate, their daughter to celebrate with. We bought her flowers because it was her birthday on Friday. Oh, it was her birthday on Friday. Yeah, and also yeah. when we came into the apartment, there were flowers because she always buys herself. Right, yeah. And they yeah. bought them together with Emma, but I don't know which day, Thursday or Wednesday. We sit down at a small breakfast table, and Adea's mother begins the first interview she's ever done about her daughter. Questions. This is you. You've been staying. You've been staying at Adea's apartment. Now, yes, and uh, it's difficult, really difficult. I'm not from here, so it's it feels kind of weird. I'm yeah. going through her stuff. I'm uh, staying in her room, feeling her energy, feeling her smells every day but she's not around. And she wanted me to come here desperately. She invited me so many times. And now, I mean, I'm here and she's not around. I mean, it's such a difficult situation. For me, it's a, it's a nightmare. Probably she'd probably want you here, probably wants you here, not, not somewhere else anyway, to be close. We are very, very connected, very. I mean, I know she somehow knows that I'm here. I'm convinced that I'm the only person she wants to see now. It's uncanny to look at Nora. Her face, her lips, even her gestures are almost exactly like what I've seen of Adea's. She moves with a solitude, a mournfulness around the studio apartment. Occasionally, she goes to the window to smoke a cigarette, and she looks forlornly over the dirty and desperate streets of Hollywood. It's warm inside, but Nora's wearing a sweater and a jacket that she doesn't take off. There's a poster of Leonardo DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street on the wall. There are several photos of Justin Bieber scattered around the bed. And Nora takes special care to show me the positive, inspirational slogans that are emblazoned on everything from photo frames to paperweights on a day's desk. But most notable is a whiteboard above the bed on which Adea has written phrases like, the source of all creation is my role model. And then below that, she's written just three words in black marker, zest for life. So this is Adea from very early on, she had this passion for being on the stage, for expressing herself, for reaching out beyond her small community, beyond borders. I mean, if you look at her diaries, recently we were moving and we found her diary from a very young age. She was, she was uh, drawing, uh, she was writing, like, I want to be a star, I want to be, you know. Even this picture here, that she bought from Marilyn Monroe when oh, yeah. I came. I am born to be a star. I'm born to be a star. And yeah, that's... yeah. Yeah, I noticed on Instagram too, she, there was a picture of her next to like an artwork where it said something like, yeah. you know, be a star in a different way. Or... I'm going to be a different star. Outside of Day's apartment is the legendary Hollywood Walk of Fame, the famous landmark with the names of A list celebrities pressed into the coral pink stars on the sidewalk. This, of course, was a place where Adea wanted her name to be one day. She was feeling so great. She was um, basically 
walking uh, on the streets and she would put the camera on and I feel so great, Mama, I want to see, I want you to come here. We have to make sure that uh, uh, you transfer and you work in the U.S. so that we, we are close together because this is where I found happiness. She really found herself. And then suddenly, just after Adea booked her first role in a Macedonian animated film, she disappeared. Adea's mom and I speak about Adea's childhood in Macedonia, her education at the American University in Paris, and her job at a jewelry store in Dubai, where she decided that regular 9-to-5 work was not the life she wanted. I asked Nora what her theories are on Adea's disappearance, and she suggests that I speak to the last person known to have seen Adea, her friend Emma. Every day is passing by, you're losing hope, but I'm really hoping she's still alive. I'm really, it's, it's too bad to, to, you know, she's only 25, so her life is in front of her. It's, yeah. it's only the beginning. Emma is tall and thin, with a strong jaw, a chiseled face, and long jet black hair. She's wearing bracelets, which you may hear jingling during the interview, along with music leaking through the paper-thin walls of this Hollywood apartment complex. This is a building designed specifically for Hollywood hopefuls. In the lobby, there's a picture of the Hollywood sign, and nearby, there are large neon letters that read, You've arrived. A message to all those who drive and fly into the city of dreams from small towns around the world. Emma recalls the exact moment she knew something was wrong. How I found out that Adair is missing was uh, this guy, Lysian, who is a common friend of me and Adair. So I called her, the phone was off, I let it go, but Lysian called me then Saturday, which was the 24th of February, and he said, no, Emma, she is not answering. So I just started running from my place to her, to the building, so I can knock on the door. Emma drove to Adair's apartment contacted the building manager, and explained the situation. But the manager wouldn't let Emma up to Adea's apartment, no matter how much she pleaded. Eventually, Adea's friends had to contact the police to do a welfare check. And not only was Adea not there, but the door was left unlocked, which they found very suspicious and very unlike Adea. And then um, we contacted the mom. The mom said, go to the police and report that she's missing. Adea's friend Angel continues the story. Angel runs a company called the Hookah Guys, and what they do is they set up mobile hookah lounges at clubs. And Adea, along with Emma, were working as basically volunteer hostesses at his hookah nights. So we go in on Monday. Uh, we spoke to the detectives. They seemed to, like, you know, take whatever information that they had or whatever, and it didn't seem like they were about to do anything. Uh, so we went out. As a matter of fact, they called us and they, they called uh, the, uh, Liz John, the person who filed the report, and said that you shouldn't go down to the police station because you guys are just, um, you're, you're there for nothing. You know, don't, don't come down to the police station. Our officers have other things to do. It's hard to believe that you can have a friend go missing under suspicious circumstances with their door literally left unlocked. And the police would tell you that they have better things to do than go search for your friend. I was shocked to hear this from Angel and asked him how this could be possible. They're not looking, and I, I think I had that conversation with one of the detectives when he said, well, you know, we want to find her. You know, do you not trust that we want to find her? And I said, no, I, I don't trust that you want to find her. I trust that you want to build a case. Right. That's more important than you, than whether she's alive or, or, or you know, possibly dead. All these interviews have taken place in Adea's apartment. As we leave, I tell Jaden that it seems like her friends are holding back with me a little bit. Like they know something more than they're comfortable sharing right now. There are a lot of, like, clarifications. Yeah, so you got all the information's sure. accurate. Got it. It's yeah. all, like, it's all sort of, like, best of their knowledge. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay, that's it. That's it. He tells me there's another person I should talk to. An ex-boyfriend of Adea's who probably has more information on her than anyone else. This is because, for some reason, her cell phone bill is in his name. And in addition, his name is on the lease to her apartment, although he never actually lived there. And this guy has a lot of the facts I've been looking for. He's an odd, fast-talking, and very intense European 
who's asked to remain anonymous for reasons that will soon become clear. So for the purposes of this podcast, we'll call him Ivan. I've recreated Ivan's side of the conversation here. I have all the information from T-Mobile and WhatsApp. The last data on the phone was uh, 1250. I called in to the bill from T-Mobile. Oh, got it. Because you have, you have our phone bill so you can see the data. Uh, yes, the phone bill is in my name. I took a screenshot and uh, I sent it to the police too. I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, are you? I'm gonna text. Are you on WhatsApp? If I text you on WhatsApp, uh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, yeah. You can text me on WhatsApp, and I'll uh, send you the screenshot from T-Mobile of the data and of the last text she sent. Ivan explains that not only does he have all of Adea's cell phone data, but he's managed to have a hacker crack her iCloud and get her crucial last messages on text and on WhatsApp. He shared with police the message that I'm about to share with you now. However, and this is worth noting, he has not shared Adea's full iCloud account and text message logs with Jaden, the private investigator. It seems a bit weird to me that her ex-boyfriend is the gatekeeper of all her personal information. The text was sent to a friend from acting class named Christian just 48 minutes before Adea's phone shut off for good. And Adea made a very strange request. She wrote, Baby, do you know where I can buy candles? Red ones. And that was the last time Adea Shabani communicated with anyone. It remains unclear just why she was asking for red candles minutes before she disappeared, and whether that's an innocent question or a significant clue. Yeah, so we're in Adea's apartment right now, and uh, we're leaving. And hey, thank you, Adea, for sharing your family and your friends with us. And hopefully we can find you or be of good or of service. You got everything? You have the key? At home that night, I review the only facts I've been able to gather so far. One, Adea Shabani was last seen on February 23rd, 2018. Two, the last place she was seen was at her local coffee shop, Rise and Grind. Three, at 12.21 p.m., according to data retrieved by Ivan from Adea's Google account, her YouTube search history shows her listening to music by Coldplay, Beyonce, Eminem, and then at 12.48 p.m., she does her last search and listens to her final song, God's Plan by Drake. Four, the last time her phone was in use transmitting data appears to have been immediately afterward at 12.50 that afternoon. I've gotten a couple of other times from people, but this is what the data from Ivan actually says. Five, according to another screenshot that Ivan sends me, her computer shows that it was powered on and her Chrome browser used from inside her apartment at 1.08 a.m. that night. So that's over 12 hours after her phone went out of commission. Six, the front door of her apartment was found unlocked, which is unlike Adea, though there were no signs of struggle inside the apartment. Seven, and most bizarre of all, her last text was asking about where to get red candles. It's a lot of information, but it really doesn't point toward any specific direction or to any theory whatsoever. So far, the only suspicious person I've spoken to is her ex-boyfriend, Ivan. But it turns out he was in Europe at the time of her disappearance. It almost seems as if someone snatched Adea right out of her apartment. But I asked Jaden about that, and there weren't any signs of a struggle. However, that night, as I'm going through all my interviews, I get this call. Hey, just wanted to give you an update. Just got a call from Angel. He just got a call that came in on his cell phone, which was... it's. It's like sort of acting as the de facto tip line until we get ours up and get the new media out. But basically, you got a call from a guy, anonymous, didn't leave a name, you know, a block number saying that he saw Adea and she was being like put into the bed of a pickup truck out in front of her apartment. She, he said that she was like out of it. Like the implication was like maybe drugged. And then the truck took off and drove south down toward Hollywood Boulevard. He gives us a description of the truck. And he even has the plate number. (laughs) 
coming up on season one of To Live and Die in L.A. All right, I'm in my car, man. I, I don't do this. I'm, 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 I'm terrified. Still a mystery what happened to 25-year-old Adea Shabani, an aspiring actress and model who went missing February 23rd. Now a twist. And the bed had been stabbed several times, and there was a huge knife left in my bed. He was, in, he was panicking, like, every second word, he was telling me, shit, shit, I don't know, I don't know. I'm like, how do you know? When was the last time you saw her, and what did she say? This shit is so fucking, it's deeper than I've ever, you could ever go. Well, I mean, just think about it. If you have, if, if, if the bullet is exiting this window, well, first of all, nobody shoots themselves four times in the head. They've searched our apartment. They've searched his birth father's place in Sacramento. They showed up in Colorado. He said, I'm going to tie, this is talking about you, and again, please keep this between us, okay? Yeah. He said, I'm going to go back, we're going to tie him up, and we're going to torture him, we're going to find out where he put a day at, even if we have to kill him. You get a sense that you have a person who is above the law and can do anything to, to play with all of us. I got one last important question. How worried do I have to be if we don't work things out and I do this, physically? I don't know. Girls go missing from L.A. every single fucking day. To Live and Die in L.A. has been a production of Tenderfoot TV and me, Neil Strauss, in conjunction with Cadence 13. The executive producers of this podcast are myself, Donald Albright, and Payne Lindsay, along with producers Alex Vespasted and Mike Rooney. Because this is an open case, anything you know about Adeya Shabani or anyone mentioned in this podcast, we want to know. Please email us at livediela at tenderfoot.tv or call us at 213-204-2073. The music and score that you've heard in this podcast is by Makeup and Vanity Set. Our theme song is Love and War by Flurry, and our show art and design are by Trevor Eiler. You can follow us on social media at Live Die LA Pod, or you can find our website with bonus content at LiveDieLA.com. I want to extend a special thanks to Brian Fishback, to Rich Burner, Kevin Richter, Station 16, Oren Rosenbaum at UTA, Eric Lynn at Shangri La, and the Nord Group. It helps a lot when you subscribe, rate, and review the podcasts that you enjoy and listen to. Thank you for listening and for your support.